everyone. Thank you for joining me again on Six Figure Soul Summit. I am Camille Miller, the founder and executive director of the Natural Life Business Partnership, a global network for soul-centered entrepreneurs. We are having another interview today with uh, mindset and peak performance coach, Ali Temple. Ali, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for uh, having me. Appreciate it. One of the reasons I'm having him on that I thought he'd be great to hear his story um, because I think he has a great backstory of where you started to where you are now. And I think it kind of fills in who you are. And I do believe that you have such an authentic um, core to you and your business. And, and we'll talk more about that as we start. But um, let's start off with a little bit about your backstory because it's very um, unique. <laughs> You want to share a little bit uh, about, like, bring us to where you are now? Because I, I do believe that before you're authentic, you kind of, what I what I call walk two roads. Mm -hmm. Like, you're, you're kind of in that, like, this is where I want to be, but this is who I am, and that's what pays my bills right now. Yeah. Right? And it's really hard to kind of take that leap into just being your authentic self. Yeah, you're so right. And I think actually about finding your authentic self is about understanding acknowledging and accepting your journey your story because all of your best lessons in life are are in the past and all the bad stuff that's happened to you so yeah yeah so i'll try and give a condensed version of where okay. I've been kind of how i got here <laughs> you know strap in um yeah so i guess my, my story always starts at the same place 10 days before my sorry one week before my 15th birthday i lose my dad in a really sudden car accident until then i was very blessed to have a kind of picture perfect life everything was great and so that happened and there is as a, you know you know there's no good time to lose a parent a week before your 15th birthday as a young boy is not a great time to lose your dad it's a really important time as you would expect my mental health took a massive, massive dive for the worst. Every cliche around mental health, self-sabotage, self-destruction, limiting beliefs, unable to sustain relationships. As I say, just at war with myself. Yeah. You know, not, not a bad person, but a very, very lost young person. And, and I, I really, really struggled. Uh, and so that went on for years and years. And the kind of thing that was the catalyst of change for me was kind of in my early 20s, I, I made the decision that, you know, I was really abusing myself and the people around about me. So I thought, so this has to change. I need some therapy. So I made the decision, found a therapist, and it was fantastic. This kind of little old guy who was kind of like this Yoda psychologist. And, <laughs> and, and I, I worked on him for about uh, three or four years ongoing, and it was, one, it was the best thing i ever done. Excellent. And that really kind of helped me make peace with what had happened to me, but it didn't solve the way I felt about the world. I, I could understand it on an intellectual level, but emotionally I wasn't there. I was still having the anxiety and the depression and not dealing well with relationships and stuff like that. And it wasn't until I started engaging with coaching later on that actually that started to change. And coaching gave me a different way to perceive the world and a vocabulary with which to communicate about it. I'm going to rewind because there's something else in that. So going so into my late teens, early 20s, I had got involved in martial arts and stuff like that because I was really hyperactive, really physical, and was actually a really good athlete. I was, I was gifted in that sense. And so the martial arts got me into acrobatics and breakdancing, and then I made the decision to move to London because I was going to be an acrobat, and that's what I was going to do. So I spent 17 years working all over the world as a professional dancer, breakdancer, and acrobat, kind of Cirque du Soleil type stuff, really high-end corporate events, very, very high-end uh, dinner shows, cabarets in like the south of France and, you know, around the Mediterranean, Dubai, um, America, Canada, you know, for the royalty of the United Arab Emirates, um, all the biggest companies in the world, you name it, I've probably done a show for it, been on live TV, I've been in movies, Incredible. you know, everything and anything. Good life, so, yeah. So it's been a very full life and, and it's, we're going to get into this, I presume, but it is about that following your own journey, going down the path less traveled, is doing the thing that you know that you're called to doing but actually overcoming your own challenges in the process and, and we'll get into that but so yeah i mean that was that I was based in london worked all over the world and kind of about maybe about four or so years ago i kind of realized that 
within industries, there's cycles. And I was aware that I was kind of doing the same thing every year. I was still being really successful. I was in the kind of top 1% worldwide of that industry. But I was kind of doing the same jobs over and over again. And it was great. And the lifestyle was, you know, five star. You know, you're flown everywhere, five star hotels everywhere, paid very, very well. It was brilliant. But I knew that that chapter was inevitably going to come to an end. What was I going to do next? And as a performer, it is very selfish. You're focused on your own skill set, about me on stage. How do I come across? What is my look, my brand? And yes, you have to do those things in business. But I wanted to do something that wasn't just about me. It was about other people and about taking all of these skills and experiences, good and bad, and how do I turn my pain into purpose? How do I use all of this madness and give that to people in something that serves a higher level? And was interested in coaching, had done a little bit with it, was reading all the books, all the spirituality, mindset, psychology stuff anyway. And I thought, I could maybe do this. And so I, I done an online course and the first day I opened the book and looked at the introduction, I just said, I have arrived. <laughs> and, and it was almost like everything that I have done for the last 25 years of my life is about this. The pain, the mental health, the yep. loss, the, you know, the destruction, the being at war with myself, plus being very successful throughout that. I've experienced being successful, but not being happy. I know what that's like. How do I bring all this together? And as soon as I opened that course, module one, day one, I said, this is it. And I've never looked back. And now I've got clients all over the world. And, you know, it's, it's, it's all kind of here now. So that's what I'm doing now. Wow, that's, a, that's an amazing backstory to like where you are now. So I'm curious because I'm a big believer in the law of attraction. Um, and I do feel that I attract people that are exactly like me. So do you find in your own practice that you're attracting maybe, you know, people that are making a lot of money, but not happy or, you know, feeling that there's a stronger purpose for what they have, but not, you know, there yet. Like that, that same kind of story, like you tell your story over and over. Cause I, I just feel like it's such everybody's journey is an important part of who they are. And to use that, you know, as your story, like use your story as part of your business, right? It becomes your passion. It becomes who you are. Yeah, you're right. And it's like, you know, is, does the universe pull in the, you know, you don't always get what you want, but you get what you need. And, you know, maybe there is an element of that. I am quite spiritual. I'm very spiritual, but I'm obsessively results orientated as well. And so I try and bring the two, but I do think that you kind of, you, you, you attract if you get your branding right, you get the clients that you really want, but also when you're authentic in your branding, right. the right person is going to look at that and go, that's my guy or that's my girl. I've got a great example of that. I uh, was on a podcast talking about things in the way that I do, telling my story. And literally two days later, somebody phoned me and said, every word you said on that podcast was like you were speaking to me. I have to work with you. When can I start? Then he didn't ask me about money, nothing. He says, yep. can I start coaching with you tomorrow? I coached him for a couple of months. He's now my project manager. Wow. And, and <laughs> he's got a skill set that I do not possess, but I've worked with him and we kind of hit it off and uh, he's now my project manager. And so there's a lot of variables to that, but yeah, you have to show up as your authentic self. When we talk about authenticity all day, I think. Yeah. But by doing that, you pre-qualify the people that are right for you and you kind of shuffle the people that are not right for you to the side. And it's important that you acknowledge that you cannot be all things to all people. And by trying to be all things to all people, you dilute your personal genius. Yeah. So don't do that. I love um, that. But, but yeah, you know, you there is a lot of uh, attraction and the, the other part of about attraction and this kind of falls in with manifesting I guess but do you attract things to you do you manifest things into reality well yes you can do that through intention and consciousness I believe but the other part of that is you have to do the work yeah and so the, the, <laughs> the, the more work you do the, the more you move towards things the more they move towards you yeah. And so it's a reciprocal process. You don't just sit there going, 
um, seven figures, seven figures, seven figures, and somebody slides you a check for seven figures. Yeah. You prime yourself, and then by priming yourself, you subconsciously program yourself to identify the opportunities that are going to take you to the place that will produce your goal or result. And so it is, it's a, it's a, a symbiotic relationship between you have to get it right in your head, but once you've got it right in your head, you identify those opportunities that you can then take action towards that then produces the results that you want. And that can be as spiritual and as authentic as you choose to make it. Yeah. So it's the action step. People are yes. always like, I'm thinking about it all the time. I'm like, yeah, thinking and wishing, that's not going to happen. Like you need, I just read, it was in a book that I'm reading about, it's called Sacred Success. But one of the, it's a Chinese proverb that they mentioned in it. I'm not saying it exactly, but it, it's that same thing. It's like, don't um, don't plant potatoes and expect to harvest without a hoe in your hand, which means yes. you have to do the work for things to grow and be what you want them to be. And I was like, oh my God, that's so good. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like thinking, great, planning, great, manifesting, meditation, intentions, all good stuff. Yeah. But nothing, nothing loves success like action. Yeah. You know, it, like it. action is the currency of progress. And if you listen to me, if you work with me, if you talk to me at any period of time, you're not going to get away without me talking about progress at some point, because we're just looking to make progress. And, and it's action that produces results because the return on investment of zero is nothing. But you can take one little action and make one tiny little bit of pro progress and then you're going somewhere. If you consistently go somewhere, you're going to arrive somewhere. Take action. And yeah. it's better to take action and fail and learn than to take no action and learn nothing. Absolutely. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about this before we turned on the camera with, I, we were both in that same mindset that I believe in slow, deliberate action, right. And be always be in momentum than huge leaps that people aren't managing. Well, yes. you know, it's people do take leaps and sometimes you have to take a leap of faith. And I think that's where spirituality comes in and allowing and just go, I don't know where it's going to end, but I see my big vision. I'll figure out how to get there along the way. Right. I do believe it's like your headlights of your car. You can only see, you know, 200 feet in front of you, but you know, the road is there, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm a big believer in very slow, deliberate steps and to be very focused instead of like wide, you know, yeah. like know, know where you're going in your path. So can you share a moment in this, like in this, in your coaching business, a moment when maybe you didn't feel like you had it all together? Or, you know, there was times you're like, did I really choose the right path? You know, because we all have those moments and I just kind of want to share it with the people watching this just because they might be at that tip. And for me, I forget what book it actually comes from, but there's like a phrase of like three feet to gold. Mm -hmm. And I always say, you know, like every entrepreneur, not every, a majority of, not, it's a very high percentage. I don't even know what it is. I'd say like 80, 90% of entrepreneurs quit right before they make it big we call it like three feet to gold and um so i just kind of want to share that we all go through those struggles and sometimes we each go through it every year going <laughs> you know so can you share a moment that maybe you didn't think you had it all together or did i really make a good choice here yes 90 something percent of the time i am in the darkness in the abyss Okay. You know, I do not have it all together 90 something percent of the time. There is a f five to 10 percent of the time I'm like, there it is clarity, certainty, confidence. Yep. Okay. Just go in that direction a little bit more. And I'm so okay with admitting that. It's not that I'm not a good coach. It's not that I'm not a good business owner. It's not that I don't have clarity over what my end goal is. I've got all of that thing in buckets. It's that if you, by its very nature, trying to achieve something that you currently don't have, means that you're moving forward into a place you've never been before. Yeah. So if I know everything about the room that I'm in, I'm, I know everything about, there's no value of me staying in this room because I know everything in this room. I need to find a dark room to get into because that's where all, that's where all the next lesson is. That's where the next stage of your professional development, your personal, your emotional, your financial, your impact, your reach, you have to get into dark spaces. And 
here, if anybody takes anything from anything I say, let it be this one thing. I have done, I don't, I, I've got it in my file somewhere, well over a thousand coaching sessions with people all over the world, from solopreneurs to CEOs to people with hundred million dollar empires. The one thing that I now know, because I'm in the heads of people every single day, it's a very privileged position for me to be in, everybody is winging it. <laughs> Unless you are the 0.1% of the 1%, the Elon Musks or the Bransons or the Steve Jobs, and even they have to deal with their own uncertainty, their own lack of knowing what's next, is that every human being is winging it. Okay. Let's dive into that just a little bit before we go any further. So I, I get what you're saying. I get the winging it because, but I also believe, and this is my, maybe my own spirituality, I call it allowing. Like, just like I said, like, I don't really know what's going to happen, but I'm totally willing to go down that path or turn that road or go, like, because I, like, I have it enough together. And I think that's the difference enough together to allow it to come to me. Yeah. And I also have the confidence to know if something bad happens or doesn't go my way, I can change it at any moment. Right. A lot of people feel like they go in this direction. They can't go backwards. And I would say, just do it, see what happens, tweak it along the way. So I don't, I get what you're saying. I just, just wanted to clarify, like, I don't really think it's people just winging it, but yeah, let's, let's I have very successful people, but I think it's because they totally get who they are. They're a, very adaptable, right? And, and they know their surroundings. And I, and I believe like your relationships and, and who you are in your own confidence has a lot to do with that. And you're right, you know, I, I like to say things like that because one, it's a bit funny, but two, it kind of it gives people a little bit of break from the kind of big, serious stuff that we're talking about. Yeah. We're talking about big, big stuff. Yes, but and I love the potential to overwhelm and overwhelm will shut you down and stop you taking action. So sometimes you have to break it up with a little bit of a joke that everybody's winging it. And some people are winging it. But I think, you know, to clarify, I I think what, what, what we're really talking about is and link, trying to link back to your question, which was, you are able to know that you can walk into that dark space because you have a relationship with yourself that if you fail, you know that it doesn't make you a failure. That if somebody yeah, said, that. It, yeah, that if somebody rejects you, it's not a reflection of your actual value as a human being. Yeah. And that you've got the emotional infrastructure, the mental infrastructure in place to be able to deal with uncertainty and potential failure. And so I, just to kind of go back to what I was saying is that the nature of trying to achieve something new means you have to be very comfortable being uncomfortable. You have to have a, a certain relationship with uncertainty. Yeah. Well, okay. So, but within that, you've got two, two lists. At any given time, you've got two lists. What can I control? What I cannot control. A lot of people lose a lot of time focusing on what you cannot control. Yep. There's a lot of variables in there. So accept them, put them to the side and dial in with laser focus and tunnel vision on all of the things that you can control. And there's a very long list of those. Absolutely. And then that allows you to kind of navigate in that dark space. What I'd to add to that, that I hope in some way answers your question is when I know that I'm in the right place is when I'm making progress or I feel positive, I feel that I'm connected to a higher purpose, I feel that I'm serving greater good, that I'm expressing myself authentically, and that even if it's only by my own standards and definition, that I am moving forward towards success on my definition of it. And that's the best I can ask for. And as long as that feels good to do that, I'll keep doing that. And if it doesn't feel good, then that's your internal system giving you a form of feedback to say something's not right here. And you've got an obligation to listen to that, find out what it means and recalibrate your orientation and where you're going and then, and then make a different decision based on that. Hopefully that pulls in a lot of the stuff that that big statement meant. Yeah, no, I think it's beautiful, beautiful. And, and what I heard from it is also not to be attached to the outcome, right? Sometimes you just have to go with it and tweak it as it comes, right? A lot of times people try to control the outcome and this is in all areas of life, right? You try, you, you're attached to what you think should happen 
and then it does it and you can adapt and blah, blah, blah. All right, so let's talk about scaling a little bit. So you start this coaching business, you took your first course. How did you get where you are today with thousands of hours of coaching behind you and leaders and CEOs? Um, what was that step like? And I always ask everyone, who was your first hire? Because I think that makes a big difference. Who was my first? You know, I don't have a, a this was my first big break sort of thing. I, uh, I have a, a fanatical work ethic and that underpins anything that I achieve. It's okay. from the minute that I started coaching and that, that course says you have to rack up 50 hours um, free as part of your portfolio to then submit your notes and all that sort of stuff. I was emailing people. They're like, there's the podcast that I was listening to with like property people. I've got real estate if you're in the US or property if you're someone else. I've gotten into property as well. So the, one of the things I've done was that there was a property podcast and these entrepreneurs that do this property podcast have just mastered this concept, what I call your ecosystem. It's what is your ecosystem of multiple streams of income within your knowledge or skill base. Okay. And I would just love the way that they've built this ecosystem. So I would reach out and message people and say, hey, I've started coaching and I need to rack up hours from my portfolio. I'd love to offer you three free coaching sessions in return for all the value that I've got from your podcast. And so rather than practicing on friends and family that I've got no business trying to coach, because one, they think of me as Ali, the idiot acrobat, but also they're not looking to really do stuff. Yeah, your friends and family are not your group. <laughs> how do I expose myself to yeah. people that I can leverage value out of, but get real experience sharpening my teeth with you know, high level players sort of thing. So my ability, and for anyone listening, this is please nurture this as a skill, is would just reach out, reach out, reach out. You know, even if that person was never going to get back to me, but also reach out to people that I knew would probably get back to me and just ask. And yeah. so that, that's kind of how I, I built that. And it, was, it wasn't that I'd done one big thing that scaled. It was a multitude of little things done consistently and done well over a long period of time, which kind of taps into your momentum thing and my progress thing as is I, I just went at it obsessively and fanatically un, until I guess at some point more recently, I kind of looked around and went, oh, all of the ideas in my head about how this was going to go are now, now. Yep. Um, so, but what practical things did I do? Um, Producing content was one of the big things is really getting myself out there on social media. And that's not a new thing. Like everybody's doing that. Yeah. But, but putting out as much content as possible that I thought was valuable. And I had to get over my own hurdles in a little, a little bit of way, you know, free myself up of that fear of judgment because I went from one industry and now I was in another industry and it was like, I was afraid of what people were going to say about my videos and, and, and right. everybody judged them and criticized them. Everyone was an armchair critic. And so, you know, you go through that <laughs> uh, and that's all fine. But it was just putting out so much valuable content, my perception of value, authentic, let me just try and help. And then watching it back and saying, what did I like about that? And what would I change about that? And that was a really good way of kind of building my personal brand. And it was when it was starting to get a lot of messages, you know, not a lot of comments, but a lot of private messages. Like, oh, I, like, I, loved, I loved what you said about this. It really resonated with me. And when I started posting content, I really stuck with the mindset stuff rather than the business stuff because it was me staying in my center. I can talk about mindset with the best people in the world all day and I stand by that because of my personal journey. Yep. I had to chisel into the business thing because I was a professional performer and I was really great in that industry, but I didn't yet know that everything that I learned there was applicable in other areas. So I had to build my confidence. Yep. And so I slowly and surely took the mindset stuff and put it into a business environment. Okay, that worked. And then let me branch out into some models and systems and productivity and hacks and peak performance stuff. Does it still work there? Yes, it still works there. And so it was really quite an organic approach to growing. And then I'll add one more thing to, thing to that is what I managed to do was to say, okay, I'm big on multiple streams of income. Yes, I can just be this one coach and do one-to-one -one all the time. I started putting on workshops. I started putting on training events and was getting people in to sharpen my craft, that delivery and presentation and to 
work with multiple people at the same time, make more money in a shorter period of time. That worked. Then another thing that I went and done is I started approaching businesses and organizations saying, this is what I do. This is the benefit of it. Is that something that works for you? And was really lucky to get brought into a couple of different organizations on both a kind of consultancy role and kind of lucked out that one of the organizations that I got brought into, they wanted me to create a coaching course for them. And that was amazing. Not only am I a coach, I'm creating a coaching course. I then went on to create the course and train other coaches. And then they say, this is all great. Do you want to get some clients through us? And I said, yes, more clients, always better. And I was getting clients through my own brand. But this other organization started drip feeding me clients that I would probably never access. And that's when I was exposed yeah. to clientele that I wouldn't have ever experienced. That's when things really started changing. That that's when my message became powerful. That's when I was working with really high level people that maybe I wouldn't have been able to access. And it was working and I was thinking, holy crap, if I'm mixing it with people that have got an empire that's a hundred million dollars or they're getting paid even a quarter of a million a year or a million plus a year, you know, a hundred, hundred grand a month or right. big numbers for me at the time. And I was thinking, wow, that's, and my stuff's working with them. That was it for me. That was, that yeah. was like, okay, everybody get out of my way. I'm, I'm on, I'm on my way now. That's and so that, that was how I sort of got into the scaling side, the growing side. My guess is that you also scaled your prices along with it. Right. So I think that's a big place where people get stuck right there. Yes. It's their own like it, it, like they don't realize that part of their journey is adding value for everyone else. Right. And every single person they coach adds an hour more of experience to themselves. Right. So as you started to level up with all of those people, the, the, the value you had to your own product is worth so much more to the, the next person that you're helping. So did you ever on. struggle with pricing? Yeah, I think everybody struggles. Yeah. You know, I had to struggle with pricing as an acrobat. You know, I sold an act. I, you know, there was dancers that yeah. would dance for free and other ones that wanted a thousand a day. And, you know, so I've, I've got, you know, 20 years of pricing and selling myself. Okay. So I've, I've, I've been from the completely lost, I don't know how to do it, I've asked for too much and asked for not enough. The, the price debate is an interesting one and you need to look at it intelligently and a lot of people don't. <laughs> I, I'm a seven figure coach, I'm a seven figure coach. Are you really a seven figure coach or is that what the market has conditioned you to market yourself as? You are only a seven figure coach if you're able to produce results where people get seven yeah. figures or, yeah. or go beyond. So you're not a seven figure coach, you're someone that produces value and alignment with a seven figure outcome. Here's what really worked for me, and if it doesn't work for you, don't take it, is I was at the start willing to get on stage and I was also willing to work with every human being that would give me an hour of their time for free. Now, there is a valid argument for that is that, that if there is someone willing to work for free, it's harder for somebody else to charge money for it. That's a valid argument, but it's also not a valid argument. And the reason, yes, it's valid that, yeah, if I'm day one of my coaching experience, you can come and work with me for free, but, is a no, but what set of results are you going to get out of me at level one? Whereas by the time I'm at level 10 and charging accordingly, an educated, knowledgeable, skilled, experienced business owner or anyone is going to know the difference providing that person is honest and open look i've only got 10 hours of coaching under my belt so i'm charging 40 dollars an hour yeah 40 pounds an hour okay cool i'm happy to work with you because that's all my budget is anyway similarly if i go to a ceo and say it's 40 bucks an hour they think i'm not working with you because you're obviously not high level enough so as my experience and effectiveness the value that i was delivering for people was going up what i was noticing and obviously i'm having quite intimate conversations is their incomes going from 30 a year 40 a year 100 a year 200 a year a million a year and so when i'm pricing myself and i'm getting that information i'm not going to work with someone that's making a million a year for 50 bucks an hour yeah providing i know that i can deliver the value deliver the result that they're asking to me and if i'm certain on that i say okay proportionally what is my role to that person what is my value to that person in their company if they take this stuff and scale it 
two, three, five, ten times, then it's worth exponentially more than 40 or 50 an hour. Absolutely. So you have to charge what you think you're worth. You also have to charge what you think that market is going to pay, but you have to charge for the results that you're getting, not what your ego or what some idiot on a webinar told you to charge, because there's a lot of dumb stuff out there. <laughs> there's a lot of dumb stuff. And it's, I agree. <laughs> you can't just decide that you're a seven figure coach and just because you've said it, that you are. No. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'll argue with anyone about this. You have to charge based on the value that you are certain that you can deliver and the outcome that you can actually produce for people. And that's results, not what you or idiot on the webinar says it is. Yeah. So take from that what you will. That's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> it really is. And um, just to add, I was, as I did this, you know, put this summit together as I was, you know, came up with the six figure souls and looking for people that fit what I was trying to, to show and display. Um, it was interesting because as I was looking through people's profiles and then you kind of look at what they're actually doing, they're calling themselves something. But when I have that conversation, I can tell that, wait, you're not there. You know, you think you're there, but you're actually not there. Like it's a, it's a thing. And you know, the, it came up with six figure souls because every single person comes as an entrepreneur, like I want to make six figures, mm -hmm. you know, it's not gross or net or what they're going to do for it. It's just, that's the, you know, when I was a sales trainer, that's everyone just picked that number. But, um, yeah, there's a realness and authenticity behind it. There's, there's a lot more anyway, whatever you had to say was awesome. Like that was a, <laughs> that was a great point you made. I think it's about understanding what you need to do to make six or seven figures. You, either, you, you have to produce huge value or massive results, or you have to influence or connect with a very high number of people. You either have to help a really small number of people do some awesome shit, yep. or you have to help many, 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 many people do some good stuff. It's like, should Beyonce get paid the amount that she gets paid? Well, should anyone get paid that? Who really cares? It's that even if she makes $1 per single and many millions of people buy that, that's why she gets paid the amount she gets paid. Exactly. And, and that's yep. it. So you're either high value or high scale, pick one, but you know, make sure that you're doing it in a way that serves some sort of, you know, higher purpose. If we're talking about authenticity, make sure that you're doing that in a way that's meaningful to you in some way. And the reason for that is, at some point, all the novelty and excitement is going to wear off and you're going to have to pick up the burden of your goal and walk uphill with it. And if your heart is not so purely and deeply in that, you will give up. And that's a massive waste of your time. But more importantly, you're going to feel real crap about yourself because you're going to think you failed. And so that's why this authenticity serve a higher purpose, be really truthful to who you are, set goals that are in alignment with your values and your mission has to be the case because it's going to get real hard real soon. The people that quit and give up is because they're not being authentic. Their goals are not in alignment with their values and their purpose and their mission. When you get those things in alignment, you will be able to walk through fire to get to the place that you're trying to get to. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much, Ali. So uh, if you loved this interview, please share it with your friends. Tell them about the summit. They can come, they can register, they can learn more about Allie. You can also join the conversation after the summit by coming to our Facebook group where all of the summer speak summit speakers and the attendees will talk about the uh, points of all the different conversations. They will recommend other speakers. It'll be a great um, way to continue this conversation beyond this summit and this summit will be an evergreen product so as we interview new speakers and um, they're just going to come over to the page and everyone who's watching this will also get to be able to um be a part of that interview so thank you ali for being a part of this interview i really appreciated all that you shared with us and your journey has been pretty awesome thank you so much for having me i really appreciate it and look forward to connecting more in the future Absolutely. Thank you.